Good evening. This is Miracle of Living coming to you live from Facebook. It's a new year and all of us were probably hoping that this new year would look a lot different from 2020 and 2021. And we're all being a little disappointed. Uh, so we still have the ongoing challenges of figuring out this new health uh, effect that we've had with the virus. We are very pleased tonight to bring you two very good experts that live and breathe this every day. They're gonna tell us what we now know that's new from what we brought you in the past. And then we're also going to talk about something we haven't touched on. And that's how COVID has affected us in how we deal with the other health issues that we all have, but we wanted to kind of stuck and stick under the rug thinking we wouldn't have to worry about it and COVID's been going on long enough now that we have measurable evidence that we're we've got to still take care of our rest of our health so grab a seat grab your popcorn I think you're going to be very interested by what you hear tonight so we're going to start with our speakers uh, I'm Dr. Mary Beth Miller I'm going to act as your moderator this evening uh, our first speaker is Dr. Anna Lopez O'Sullivan. She is an emergency room um, physician. She is board certified at Torrance Memorial. She's originally from Guatemala and has a special interest in health disparities in medically underserved populations. She completed her medical education and residency training at UCLA and continues as a clinical professor of emergency medicine for the All of You UCLA residency program. Uh, Dr. Lopez O'Sullivan, uh, you have the floor. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for the kind introduction. Um, again, I'm Dr. Lopez, and I'm very proud to be here tonight to be able to bring you some additional information of what we know about the state of uh, uh, COVID today and what's been going on in our community. So today what we wanted to talk about is uh, the hidden epidemic of COVID and the delay of care. Um, I think it's really important to, first of all, talk about what we know of what's been going on with the current surge in COVID. Uh, we know that the most obviously common variant right now is Omicron. Uh, we are still in the works of finding out more information about this particular variant. Uh, what we do know is that it appears to be more contagious as many people have already um, established. Uh, however, it's important to know that we are getting new information about uh, how Omicron works and how the actual virus in itself, the way that it has mutated, does not necessarily mean that the peak viral loads are higher than previous variants. Um, it may appear that Omicron is actually having more of immune evasiveness, and so previously infected patients and vaccinated patients are more vulnerable to uh, reinfection in itself. Uh, so again, it's important to realize that it's not, although these variants all come from the very ancestral COVID uh, initial strain, these can change and can have different mutations in the virus in itself that lead to its fitness being different um, and obviously more uh, able to be contagious to others. Uh, I have seen in many places that people have uh, this idea that Omicron is milder. Uh, I think that when we come into contact with patients right now, especially in the emergency department, my experience has been that in individuals, uh, there is a wide variability of symptoms. And I think it's really early still to tell if we know that Omicron is truly milder. I think in an unvaccinated patient, uh, Omicron can still lead to a lot of very, very serious uh, complex complications, uh, which not only affect the lungs, of course, but uh, the brain, the heart, kidneys, and every patient is a little bit different. So although we know that we are not the same naive population from the beginning of this pandemic, there's a lot of us that have one 
obviously hybrid immunity from vaccination and infection in the past, immunity from infection, and just pure uh, immunity from the vaccine, uh, that the symptoms are going to be very, very variable. And as we talked about earlier, Omicron is a little bit of a different type of variant than Delta and the previous Alpha strain and the original strain of COVID. So is it truly milder? Um, I would say in my experience, yes, in, some, in many people it has been, but it's also very early. Remember, we've only seen this particular variant uh, in wide populations for only several months here in the United States. It's important also to not generalize the experiences of other countries that have different access to care, a different population uh, age range, and also uh, different access to healthcare and other communities. Um, another thing about Omicron that's I just touched upon a little bit is that vaccines are still very effective in providing protection from hospitalization and death. Uh, I talk a lot about vaccines being like seat belts. So you can wear your seat belt and unfortunately it won't keep you from getting into the accident, but it will keep you from dying from the accident. And that is still holding true for our vaccines that we have now. We're extremely lucky that we have vaccines that were based upon the initial COVID strain that are still highly, highly effective at pro protecting people from the worst outcomes. So it is very, very important to realize that we're not back at square one when it comes to vaccines. They're still very, very effective. And I can tell you that from seeing patients every single day in the emergency department, uh, that unvaccinated is obviously the most vulnerable. Then there are two vaccines and three vaccines are always best. And generally the vaccinated patients with boosters tend to have more mild symptoms and tend to have the best outcomes. And that seems to be holding true still um, with all of our mRNA vaccines. Of course, with the viral vector vaccines, we seem to have had a little bit of less success with that. However, we know now that we can use a combination of mRNA boosters. And so if you're eligible for it, I would highly encourage it. Um, another change with Omicron is that our testing has unfortunately been a little bit um, flawed. Now, it's important to know that testing is still a very important part of this pandemic. Um, we have been working very, very hard to try to get tests widely available. And of course, that has been very difficult to do. Um, however, it's important to make sure that every one of us knows that if you have the ability to get tests, there are available um, and you can try to purchase them. And if you don't have the ability right away, then you should still look and see where, where are your options that are available. The rapid antigen tests, unfortunately, appear to be slightly less sensitive um, than uh, than they previously were at catching active infections. So with perfect collection rapid antigen tests in previous COVID strains, we were seeing about a 60% sensitivity and that's the ability of the test to catch an infection. So it was 60%, so six infections out of 10 would be caught. Uh, that means that you would still have four that weren't caught. That's with perfect collection. No test is, unfortunately, no test is perfect. Now with the Omicron, uh, strain and the way that the virus has mutated, unfortunately, we've seen that sensitivity drop as low as almost 30%. So that's important to know because that means that it's not going to catch all of the infections. So if you are sick and you have symptoms, it's important that these tests be used not to rule out infections. So if it's negative, it does not mean that you don't have it. It's more important to use it as a ruling in. So if you have symptoms and you test positive, it is very sensitive at actually being positive and you do not need to follow it up with a PCR test. So if you have symptoms and you test negative, my recommendation as of right now is to continue testing and isolating at home. So I would recommend that you stay home, test again in at least 12 to 20, ideally 24 hours later. I know the tests are hard to come by, but you may have to do two and even three tests to test positive. Um, so that's an important change with our rapid antigen tests. The PCR tests are still highly sensitive and specific, of course, so that is not an issue. And if you have access to PCR testing, then of course that is the ideal situation. Um, right now with uh, our Omicron surge, I think, uh, the news obviously is able to give uh, some idea of what's going on out in the public. And what I can tell you from what's, come, what's happening in the emergency departments all across uh, LA and the entire country 
is basically the phenomenon that we're seeing is the volume of people that are sick at the same time. So whenever there is a higher population that is sick and it goes across all populations, that means that our healthcare system will be overwhelmed. Um, additionally, unfortunately, we have, we have seen that because Omicron has been um, more contagious, we have seen hospital workers and their family members become sick. So that puts everything out of ratio to what we normally would see. Um, when you have more patients and more sick people that are coming to the hospital for various reasons, and not only uh, patients are, you know, not only COVID patients are coming to our hospitals, but of course patients that have other emergencies and other medical issues that are going on, but you have less personnel, then we are becoming, uh, we've become extremely overwhelmed to the point where we have been working out of capacity. Um, additionally, we are seeing with this current wave that more children are becoming affected. Um, I think we're still able to say that children have not been uh, fortunately experiencing the more severe outcomes that we've seen with adults in COVID. Um, having said that, they are unfortunately not completely protected from that. And uh, so we're seeing uh, the younger population that are very vulnerable and unfortunately that are still not eligible to be vaccinated. Um, a higher proportion of them are becoming ill. And so we're seeing a lot of those patients right now uh, in the emergency department, there is a proportion that is being uh, admitted to the hospitals. Um, and that has been a bit higher than previous strains. And then of course uh, we have had a lower vaccination rate, I think, than that we would hope in the pediatric population. So that's also becoming, adding to the numbers of uh, pediatric patients that we're seeing. Um, like I said before, once we get these, all of these factors working together, uh, it adds to a perfect storm of our hospitals just working over the capacity. So it's not necessarily the rate of hospitalizations, but the rate of the hospitalizations to the resources that we have available. So we have a lot of hospitalizations and COVID has still proven to uh, have the highest number of hospitalizations right now that we've seen. And when we have a decrease in uh, resources, then of course we have um, seen, we've seen what, we're, what the outcome of that is. Um, I know that uh, part of this talk is talking about the delay of care, and that's important to touch on because we have been seeing some patients that uh, have unfortunately been affected by COVID in a different way, which is by not coming to the emergency department or reaching out to their medical providers for care. Um, I think that the main decision driving this is usually that people, uh, patients are scared to come to the emergency room. I know that people are scared of coming into contact with potentially infectious uh, patients. And also um, they are, I think a lot of people are very conscientious and are mindful of the allocation of resources and they don't feel that sometimes they want to use up those resources. I do want to reassure you that we have done everything possible to make sure that we um, use our triage system to separate patients as best as we can. And also that we want to see patients in the emergency department that need the care. We will always be here for um, all those patients. Uh, some of the examples of delay of care that I've seen uh, recently, and I'll just talk about some of the last cases I've had from my shift yesterday and probably two days ago, um, and I'll probably see tonight. So unfortunately, we have seen patients that have um, paid less attention to things that they normally would have. So chest pain, we often say, you know, in the right, in the population that's high risk, any type of chest pain is usually something that should be, you know, concerning um, to a point. Um, so I've seen quite a few more patients have delay of care from ischemic causes, so heart attacks in themselves, and they may have just stayed at home or just put off coming in. Um, other cases that we see are delay of care and strokes. And that is an intro, those are interesting cases because strokes are often cared for best when they've seen, when they're seen at the onset of symptoms or very soon after. And there are types of strokes that need to be evaluated and treated within a very tight window of time. So it's important that um, if people feel like they're having or they have a family member that they um, feel is in distress or having stroke-like symptoms, it is important to still you know, call 911 if you don't have the means to bring them in. But of course, we're always, uh, we always want to see them as soon as possible. 
Um, other examples that I've seen recently are abdominal emergencies. So things that are very usual to us to see almost you know, within a day of pain. We see a lot of patients with appendicitis um, that have come in you know, several days after their symptoms started and things, issues with their gallbladder or if they've had you know, some type of bloody stools. And these are all things that are always cared for best when they're seen early. So it's important that if you have any concerning symptoms, any type of issue, uh, first, you can always reach out to your primary medical provider. But of course, if there's anything concerning to please continue to seek care. Um, other things that we've seen is delay of care in trauma and falls. So many of our um, older patients have had issues where they have, you know, common things like falls and they either don't tell their family members or they've decided, you know, I feel okay, I don't want to go in. And um, so that also causes a delay. Have, I've seen cases of delay of care. Uh, ca cancer complications, um, issues with infections uh, often are also pushed aside by patients. So it's important to make sure that you know what to look out for and always be in contact with any providers that you have so that you know what is okay to take care of at home, but when to seek um, additional assistance. And lastly, one of the easy low hanging fruits that we see are unfortunately patients that have been unable to follow up with their primary care doctors because all of our all of our health system has been overwhelmed, including our wonderful um, primary doctors in the community. They are also backed up and seeing a lot of patients, as many as they can per day. And sometimes patients put off getting their medication refills. So common things like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, that normally would be cared for and easily treated with medication. Uh, if you run out of your medicine, then unfortunately these can lead to more emergent issues. Um, so it's always important to keep that in mind. Um, this was a case that I just had uh, the other night and it just uh, illustrates a bit of the delay of care. This was a, a youngish lady, that she was in her 60s and um, she actually just had, a, she woke up in the middle of the night and she was going to the restroom and tripped and fell and hit the side of her, uh, of her nightstand. And she unfortunately had this issue that had been going on for over a month. And so she went to work, she had been, she was, she's a real estate agent and had been going to work. And it wasn't until many, many of her coworkers noticed that she just wasn't acting right. And she finally said, hmm, maybe I should go get checked out. Um, this was cared for very differently than if we would have seen her potentially uh, at the onset of symptoms. And so this is uh, one of those cases where unfortunately I think COVID um, prevented her from coming to the hospital and uh, we don't certainly want that to happen. Um, this was another case of a patient that um, unfortunately came in with a complaint of dizziness for two weeks. Um, this is a very unfortunately scary rhythm and can be deadly for some patients. She was actually very lucky that she was able to actually drive herself in and sit in our waiting room and actually um, waited several minutes while she was there until we got the EKG and this was um, seen and then of course was treated very swiftly. Um, but two weeks is a very long time and this could have been, this could have ended very differently for this patient. So important to know that if you feel like things are going, uh, that things are not right and you have symptoms that are concerning to you, that we, that's what we are available for. Um, things that you can do right now, just to go back on uh, what we're trying to have our community um, be empowered and feel like they can do because we are all in this still together and we still need you to do your part uh, in helping us best take care of not only um, you, but the rest of our community. Uh, it's important still, our best, best tool against COVID right now is prevention. Prevention is always better than cure. And if you are able and eligible to get vaccinated, it is ideal and it is ideal to have two and three, the, your booster shot, your third shot is still um, very, very highly recommended. And like I said, I've seen many, many patients 
I can't count anymore, <laughs> um, but I think that it is uh, very important if you have your booster to know that you have the highest level of protection and you are not only prevented, well, you're not only protected um, from the long-term, highly protected of, uh, against the long-term effects of COVID, uh, we do see uh, in data right now about a 50 to 60% decrease in long COVID in our fully vaccinated and boosted patients. Um, and you're also protected from uh, hospitalization and the ultimate outcome of course death. Um, it is time right now to upgrade your masks. I think we've heard probably a lot about this in the news. Uh, I know we've all gotten a large cohort of fashionable masks that we wear out. And it is sad to, uh, for me to tell you that unfortunately those are probably, those are not good anymore uh, for Omicron. It is ideal for uh, you to get surgical masks. And if you're gonna be in a situation where you feel you might not have um, the ability to have ventilation or it's a high risk potential exposure, which I would hope you would uh, avoid if you can, um, you can upgrade your mask to a KN95 and of course an N95. I realize that these masks are sometimes not as comfortable to wear. Um, I would say to the general public and you know that it is, they're not designed for you to wear all day. Um, myself and Dr. Sherman can wear them all day and we could probably sleep in them at this point. Um, but yes, I understand they are not comfortable. They're not meant to be comfortable. They're meant to be protective and they protect not only you, but they protect the person uh, and the people that you are around. And that is the, the whole point behind mask wearing, protection for everybody and yourself. Um, you can still continue to avoid large crowds and unnecessary travel. Um, it's important to know that two years in, it's still the same. Um, you still need to be mindful. It's still the same mindset that we need to have to be purposeful with our actions and to make sure that we are doing our part in ending the transmission with us. If you happen to be infected, um, it's not a marker of morality. It should never be. And what is important to know is that you should be able to tell people if you have been exposed or infected, that it ends with you, um, or do everything that you can to, to do that. So avoiding large crowds is part of that, um, because of course in large crowds we have a lower rate of proper mask wearing um, and a higher, higher likelihood that you're gonna be exposed to a situation where you just don't have control of uh, what's going on. Uh, in uh, order to avoid some of the potential bad cases like I illustrated a little bit before, it's a good idea to make all of your appointments uh, well in advance. So things that you know are coming up potentially, your physical, you have preventative um, appointments that you need to make, colonoscopies, mammograms, all of that stuff. Make Call your offices and make your appointments very, a, lot, a lot of time in advance. It's important to know that um, all of our facilities are doing our best to make sure that we accommodate all the patients that we can. But you have to remember that we are trying to make it safe for everybody. And in that uh, type of environment, it means that usually we're not working at our general full capacity. And just like I said before, we have a lot of our staff that are potentially sick or caring for others that are sick. So we have maybe, you know, it, it sounds really silly, but sometimes it could be that you just don't have you know, potentially a, an extra secretary that's answering the phones because now they are, you know, doing two jobs that they may have not um, been doing before, or you just have one medical assistant, or you have maybe one nurse instead of three, um, because like I said, they're either out sick or caring for somebody that's sick. So all of our clinics are um, trying to accommodate as many people as possible, but important to remember that you will probably have to make your appointments well in advance, um, and that is part of something that you have the power to do. What to do if you get sick? Um, I think that this is something that I've even had to uh, do within my own circle. And it's important to have a plan. It's hard to talk about what to do when we're gonna be sick, but it really does take the anxiety away, which is part of what I see a lot with COVID is the anxiety of what happens if it happens to me have a plan. I think at this point, it would be realistic to say that we will all come in contact in a situation where you will probably be exposed and have the unfortunate uh, experience of having to either isolate and test and may become infected. So just make sure that you have a plan. 
um, like I said before, have rapid antigen tests at home. That will keep you from trying to scour the internet, unfortunately, right now. Um, I know that uh, visits to places where you can have testing are um, extremely overwhelmed too. So it's important to do what you can. Keep your rapid antigen tests at home. If you have symptoms, like I said, if you come up uh, negative ones, please don't stop there. Um, continue testing. And if you are able to make an appointment for three days from now, you know, if you get symptoms today, you test negative, then get a PCR test a day or two later, and that can actually rule out an infection. So that is how I would recommend uh, proceeding with that. There are some other viruses that are circulating in the community right now, RSV, rhinovirus, and other common colds. Um, and those will, um, obviously, if you have one of those infections, then your PCR will be negative. Uh, but they have very similar symptoms to Omicron. And so we cannot clinically tell you, you don't have this infection. So as much as I wish I could, um, it, the gold standard is going to be a PCR test. Uh, know your testing sites. Uh, the internet is obviously a good resource for that. Uh, LA County actually has a lot of uh, um, very accessible sites. And there are always pop-ups that I see um, generally in communities where you can um, try to see if you can get a test. And I included those two websites of, oh, sorry, the two websites of some of the places where I recommend um, going if you want to find a test site near you. Um, like I said before, I touched a little bit about testing and how our rapid antigen test should be used. Um, this kind of illustrates a little bit about how we see the viral load uh, of COVID affect how our tests work. So in this, let's say in this case, I have a vaccinated patient with uh, symptoms about three days after an exposure. Now it's important to remember what your symptoms are, fever, cough, runny nose, sore throat, headache, fatigue, body aches, and maybe all of us feel that at some point <laughs> in the day, um, but be mindful of kind of what you're feeling. Um, sometimes low back pain can just be the beginning of something. So just be mindful of what uh, you're feeling in your body. Vaccinated patients we actually find generally become a little bit symptomatic earlier before their rapid antigen tests even become positive um, because their body has seen the virus before. So they actually develop symptoms and then it's not until the viral load starts to increase that the rapid antigen test becomes positive. So if you can see here, a rapid antigen test will start to become positive at about days four and five. And like I said, that is with perfect collection. A PCR test on the other hand will be, be positive usually starting from the onset of any type of symptoms because that's when the PCR test is able to augment the virus in the testing and it will continue to be positive for a long period of time. We've seen it positive up to 90 days in some patients. So if you have a rapid antigen test that is negative, your PCR will be positive potentially for a longer period of time. Another reason why we say, please don't uh, PCR test or get a lab to do a PCR test for going back to work because you're no longer infectious after you know this point over here, but your PCR test can continue to be positive. So you can test into an infection with a PCR test and a rapid antigen test, but you should really just test out of your quarantine with a rapid antigen test, not with a PCR in itself. Um, so that's important to know. So if you have your symptoms, um, I still generally recommend, I know that the guidelines have been uh, a little bit confusing. I generally still recommend uh, if you are symptomatic, your quarantine should be 10 days and you should break your quarantine with a rapid antigen test. So if you see over here, you should be right about this point where your rapid antigen test should no longer be positive. Um, your PCR will still be positive potentially, but you will be negative, hopefully with your rapid antigen. If you do test positive with your rapid antigen, and I have seen this before as well, where some patients are not clearing the virus as quickly, then you should continue to isolate, continue to mask, and you should test again daily, ideally, until your rapid antigen test becomes negative. Uh, treatments. Uh, I think the treatments for COVID-19, uh, we are in a position now where it has been at least um, very promising. I know that it's been frustrating. You have to remember that we are two years in to this pandemic. Um, 
two years is not a very long time to see a new pathogen in medicine. So the fact that we have a vaccine and that we have evolving treatment options is quite incredible still. Um, remember that if you have more, the more common presentation of COVID, which are mild upper respiratory symptoms, the treatment is still gonna be the same things that we would recommend for the common cold. So make sure, again, have a plan. If you get sick, make sure you have ibuprofen and acetaminophen at home. Of course, if you have underlying issues, then make sure that you know which ones you're able to take. Um, regular cough medications are generally at least helpful. Um, no cough medicine, to be honest, is that great. <laughs> and cough is actually a protective reflex. So we are going to experience cough with COVID many times, and it, it will at least make you feel a little bit better. So things just like over-the-counter Robitussin and Mucinex are okay if you're able to take them. If you have additional symptoms like diarrhea, still over-the-counter medications like a regular Imodium or Pepto-Bismol to help uh, settle your stomach are still okay. Um, and if you develop more severe symptoms, that's when we would want to potentially see you in the office or in the emergency department. With COVID, we do see a proportion of patients that develop symptoms like nausea and vomiting. Um, that is generally something that can be tolerated for a short period of time. But if you're unable to keep fluids down and you're unable to keep yourself well hydrated, then you're at high risk of developing complications. And so you might need medications like anti-nausea medications to help you through this. It doesn't necessarily mean that you'll need hospitalization, but you might need additional assistance. So that's one uh, situation. If you're an asthmatic and you need sometimes um, additional albuterol treatments or Zopinex treatments, that's something that you should at least have planned and hopefully have in hand if you do become sick. But if not, you should reach out to your medical provider to make sure that you can get a prescription for that. As far as COVID specific treatments, um, the, the main treatments that we have out right now um, and that are still in the works are, of course, they kind of fall more into two uh, distinct areas. Um, we have antibody treatment and antiviral treatment, and then we have steroids that we're using as well that are not COVID specific, but that are used by um, medical professionals to treat it. Now, it's important to know that with Omicron, unfortunately, uh, some of the antibody cocktails that we were using earlier, you may have, many of you may have heard of uh, Regeneron and some of the other um, commercially available uh, antibody treatments that were being used uh, are unfortunately not very effective against Omicron and are now really only used in very high, highly selective populations that are at high risk. There is one type of antibody treatment that is used now um, and is approved for mostly prophylactic use. So it is not something that is really used uh, and widely available. Um, but if you are a patient that has um, had underlying immunocompromised state or are at high risk for developing complications, this is part of where you need to make a plan and make sure that you talk to your specialist, such as if you have a pulmonary specialist or somebody that is managing potentially like a transplant patient, a transplant coordinator, if you are gonna be eligible potentially if you're exposed to COVID or you need treatment. Um, antiviral treatments are also being used. Um, we have some that have had, you know, obviously some success. And with COVID, I really have to say that, you know, it all depends on, you know, many, many factors. And it just doesn't have to do with the medication on its own. Um, it has to do with the patient themselves, their immune status, um, and potentially just how their body is reacting to the virus. And that's actually what we see um, is driving most of the outcomes is just the inflammatory response. Uh, we probably um, now are going to be seeing some more of these treatments come uh, more widely available. I think a lot of us have heard right now, I know many of you guys have heard about uh, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, which have um, now received EUA emergency use authorization. Um, the important thing to know about these is that one, uh, they are approved for very, again, high risk populations. So these are not gonna be medications that are prescribed widely. And two, they are unfortunately very hard to access right now. Um, the US has ordered about 20 million doses, which should arrive at the end of January, but these have to be distributed out to the entire country. And so you have to remember that there is a very 
unfortunate lag of time between um, hearing about a medication and then actually clinically coming to use it is very different. Um, so I ask that you give us, again, a little bit more time, um, but we are in a state where we see more promising therapeutics coming through. Um, as far as other treatments, there are lots and lots of other medicines that are undergoing investigation right now. And there are so many questions and so many things that we could talk about. Um, it's important to know that uh, the internet is a great resource, um, but it is also full of misinformation. And so please consult your medical providers if you feel like you'd wanna get a prescription for something or try something even over the counter things. Um, and of course, if there's any unusual medications or treatments that are out there that are being used, just remember that medications come with side effects. And a lot of the times we do see patients, unfortunately, um, that suffer from these. So important to know that. Uh, lastly, I would like to just touch upon when we wanna see you in the emergency department if you have COVID. Um, if you have chest pain, please come and see us. It can lead, you know, it could be many things, and we would like to make sure that it's not your heart, not your lungs, or something else going on that's more serious. Um, nowadays, we have widely available pulse oximeters that you can purchase at pharmacies and online. If you do have COVID, we are not seeing a lot of uh, hypoxia as much as we were with Delta, um, but it's a good idea to keep it on hand if you're feeling short of breath, which is a common symptom of COVID. Uh, measure your oxygenation, measure it a few times until you get a stable number. If it's less than 93% and it maintains that way, we definitely want you to come in and see us. If you have a family member or you feel uh, somebody that you know has COVID is looking confused, they're difficult to arouse. If you have a child that um, appears to be um, unable to be aroused and not awake, we definitely want to see you. Um, if you're unable to keep uh, any oral fluids or foods down, then we want to see you because we don't necessarily treat the COVID itself, but we want to treat your symptoms. So the nausea, just as I talked about earlier, and make sure that you're well hydrated. Um, if you are fainting, if you're losing consciousness, if you're standing up and you feel like you're going to faint, um, sometimes that can be a marker for more serious things. And um, if it resolves within a few minutes, it may be that you can care for it at home, drink fluids. Um, but if it's happening persistently and or you have other symptoms accompanying it, like chest pain, shortness of breath, you're becoming sweaty, then we definitely want to see you then. And that is my portion. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lopez Sherman. It's always good to be able to hear from somebody who is actually living this and seeing this every day. So your insights are really helpful. Our next uh, speaker, we've had the pleasure of hearing before, uh, Dr. Brian Sherman. Uh, he finished his medical school at the University of Guadalajara and New York Med Medical College. He did his internal medicine training at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. He completed his fellowship in critical medicine at the Mount Sinai Hospital School of Medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine, critical care, and neurocritical care. And on top of all that, he's one of the best speakers I've ever heard. So welcome, Dr. Sherman. Well, that's putting me on the spot. I mean, hello, everybody. You know, what, what is going on here? It's getting crazy. The world is crazy. Sometimes I feel like the earth is spinning faster and I'm just trying to hang on. I'm sure we all feel like that because if I feel like it, I know you do. So I'm going to talk about a few different things tonight. I'm a critical care doctor, and my pulse went up when I saw that electrical activity on somebody's heart that Dr. Lopez was showing at beats of 188 beats a minute. I thought I was gonna pass out when seeing that. I don't want that to happen to you, but we gotta talk about really a bigger picture. So let me show you my slides, and I call it the hidden pandemic, because you know what? There's this pandemic, we all hear about it. We turn on our TV, we talk to our family members. You know, we have 
vibrant discussions with our neighbors. You know, we have disagreements with friends that we have had for a lifetime. And now you're challenging all that wonderful love and joy you've had with all your family members and friends and clubs you belong to and people you know. Every, all cards are in. Everything's on the table right now. And it's very, very difficult, very confusing. And you know what? It's just hard. It's really hard. So without further ado, let's talk about tonight's topics on, for my piece, health, money, love, and purpose. Okay? What's happening with this pandemic? What's going on behind curtain number four? That's what I want to know. So first of all, let's touch a little bit about health. Dr. Lopez talked about the delay of care, I agree. There is a pandemic of itself of delay of care worsening the situation. Delay for surgeries, delay for emergencies. That little word TIA means transient ischemic attacks, which are like small strokes that resolve. Oh, honey, I'm feeling a little faint, but it goes away and like, okay, it's nothing. But all of a sudden, the day later, you find out that now you're found down you can't talk and you can't move on as you have a stroke. Because normally you might have gone to the doctor for those symptoms before, but because of pandemic, nobody wants to go. Delay for primary prevention. How about your teeth? I'm going to be honest. I haven't seen a dentist in two years. It's not good, not good. I'm with you. I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. I need to go to the dentist. New diagnosis in the ED instead of the primary care office. People wait, they're walking to the ED. I've got some stomach pain and I've had it for now two years. Boom, bam, you get a CAT scan and you got a big tumor in there. But if you had gone two years ago, we might've caught that when there was a lot of treatment. Now you got this big tumor, it's spread, it's metastasized. You don't have COVID. You've got another problem, worse, okay? We wanna avoid those things. That's what's happening behind the scenes. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Okay, a little more about health. You have new dynamics and relationships with medicine. Believe it or not, you have a relationship with medicine, whether you have one or not. That's a relationship. You may not have a doctor, you may be very healthy and you've never seen one. But guess what? Not having a relationship is still a relationship waiting to happen. The question is, is do you want to happen in the emergency room or do you want it to happen in the ability to help predict and know how your body is? You need to think ahead, make appointments ahead, have a health plan for yourself, what your needs are and making appointments six months, a year, two years, whatever it'll take, book it. If you have to change it later, you got to change it, but having no plan is not the way to go. Missed heart attacks, you just heard about that. Missed strokes, like I talked about this transient effects of things that can happen, you feel a little lousy. Human nature is, it's nothing. Oh, it's the tacos I ate. Ah, my ankle hurts, it's nothing. I just fell riding my bike. Oh, I got a headache, it's just a headache. And yeah, most of the time, thankfully that's true. But during COVID, you haven't had the advantage of doing the things you would normally do going to see your physician, calling your physician, getting an email, maybe going to the urgent care, you know, following up with maybe your other practitioners that, you know, you go to see your dentist and you get a blood pressure check and they say, oh, your blood pressure is high, now go see your doctor. So you're not in contact, you're not accessing, we're not having that relationship anymore because there's been a breakup because of COVID and she is very demanding but we need to push her out the door so you can be seen. Delayed elective surgeries. I'm gonna talk about that. Okay, first thing, let's talk about language and being descriptive. Do you speak my language? Do I speak your language? Absolutely. But there's a language that we need to hear and I wanna empower everyday people, including my own friends and family, is as you're approaching us during COVID and you're making those appointments at your doctor's office, 
is trying to be very descriptive about how you feel. Because most of the time when we talk about our symptoms to our positions, we talk in terms that we learned as children often. You know, I've got, I feel gassy, doc. You know, I just, I've got this like, just it's heartburn. Or, you know, I just feel a little achy or itchy. And they're kind of sometimes non-descriptive and you really have to think about what you wanna say. So you really tell us how you're feeling because often what even I, as humans, will say a word, but inside our brain, that little voice is scared. And we're saying the alarms are going off. And that's why we are trying to see the physician or getting on the tele visit with them. But we're saying, hey, I think it's the tacos I ate. I like tacos, so I'm gonna use those as an example. But it's the tacos I ate last night and I'm feeling a little heartburn. But the reason you're calling is because when it happened at three o'clock in the morning and the chest pain woke you up, it was bing, 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 bing. I'm scared, I'm scared, I could die, something's wrong. Maybe this is a heart attack, I better call my doctor tomorrow. But when you call us, it's like, well, doc, I think I had the tacos last night. That's human nature, it's okay. But now's the time to slow down during COVID because you don't have the access. Everybody's busy, light staff, all the things you've heard about, you don't have that access. So now when you do, you gotta really think about what you're saying and that responsibility does lie on you and our responsibility is to listen really carefully, get involved in your life, get involved in your story, listen to what you're saying and ferret out all that important stuff so we can treat you. Oh, of course, don't be afraid. Fear is no excuse to go into the urgent care emergency if you were scared and worried. If you were scared and worried and thinking about it, probably means you should go. Okay, if it comes up in your mind that maybe I should go to the emergency room, that's probably a good time to listen to that inner voice because you're probably not wrong because most people don't wanna go even pre-pandemic. But if your voice is telling you now that you probably should go, and you're having an emergency and you're feeling like you're losing control of what's happening with your body, that's a good sign you probably are out of control and you should come see us. Whether it's sweatiness or shortness of breath, you know, you know those symptoms. You know when you feel scared. We don't want you to avoid us. We're doing a fantastic job of getting people separated into the areas of COVID. Hey, if you're coming for chest pain, you're not gonna be there, okay? You get in, you see us, we're gonna take care of you. We're gonna help as a team. We're gonna get you fixed, all right? Please don't be afraid. All right, here's an example of some delayed care. A study last year at an Ohio trauma center showed that diabetic foot ulcers were being delayed for weeks and weeks, several three months or longer. And they found that they had a higher rate of amputation. So this is, you have a chronic diabetic foot ulcer, you're going to your clinic, you're getting wound care, but now you're delayed, you haven't been going. So now you have a 10 times higher, 10 times 0.8 higher time of receiving any amputation because you've delayed. And you is all of us. Me is you, you is you. You have a 12.5 times higher for any major amputation. We don't want amputations. Post amputation mortality rates remain high. 27.3% within a year mortality. Street language, death, okay? Can be up to 63.2% for serious infections and amputations up to five years, okay? This is a big deal. Diabetes is very common. Hey, and a lot of ulcers are common. Maybe some of you have these. Maybe you know people who have diabetic foot ulcers but we can't delay this care. Okay, here's another study and I have all of these on my bibliography at the end. There's another study, 12 weeks delayed surgeries for cancer, decreased overall survival in breast, lung and colon cancer, okay? When breast cancers were analyzed by stage, there was an decrease in overall survival for stages one and two, but not stage three. This was all last year, three months cancer surgery was delayed. Why not stage three? Well, stage one and two is early. 
guess what? That's when you're most going to respond to great treatments, okay? We want to get you in early. We want to give you whatever you need, chemotherapy, adjunctive therapy, if you need surgery and chemotherapy. We want to get you in early so we get you cured. Stage three is already pretty darn sick. So they are already sick. They still need to be seen. You still need to come in and get all that done. But the thing what happens is that preventative side where you're early and you just got this diagnosis and you don't know what to do, you can't delay because your overall survival will be less. Everybody has to come in. I'm not saying the stage threes don't, you absolutely have to. But the idea is getting disease early, beating the monster back. Okay, let's talk a little bit about something else that's affecting your health. Where did the money go? I think that's gonna get everybody's attention, okay? There's an increase in inflation right now, okay? COVID has turned this world financially upside down. Everybody's feeling something. Increase in inflammation. What is it? inflammation? It probably is inflammation too. An increase in inflation. This means the stuff that I get costs more. So in reality, everybody gets a pay cut. Everybody got a pay cut because now whatever I'm paying for is more expensive. So then there's the chain of supply. Where do the things come? Where do they come from when I buy them? Where are they coming from? Energy. What kind of energy does it take for me to get the stuff I want? Okay, some of this is medical stuff. Where do the walkers come from? The canes, you know, where does my wheelchair come from? Where are these things made? What kind of energy does it take to produce and manufacture those to get them to your house? Let alone a chip to make your car or some electrical component in your car. I had a car in the shop, it took a month to get a little part that would have taken a few days before the pandemic. I call this ice, ice, ice. Increase in infl inflation, chain of supply issues, and the energy which it takes to get it to you is very important. If you have somebody growing vegetables down the street, well, there's not a lot of energy, you go down there and buy that. But if it's coming from across the world, some tropical fruit, during our winter and the boats are hanging offshore, well then there's a lot of energy that it takes to get that to your plate or a medication or some medical device. All right, here's something I wanted to talk about. This is the cost of goods and what's happened and things that are affecting you. And I know there's a pointer here. What's the point if you don't have a pointer? So. If you look, this is 2020, 2021 with the months of December. Let's take this first one, gas, utility. Man, I had my fireplace on. I was really upset that it cost so much money. It's a crime. So you come down here early in 2020 and look at that, the price of gas. This is all from the labor statistics boards. Um, all the way up here to 29% increase. My goodness, okay? And of course it's winter, all right? So any of you washing clothes, turning on your house heater, fireplace, it's costing you 29% more than it did really back over here in early 2020. All right, let's take a look. Gas, been to the gas pump lately. We're in California. Forget about all the taxes and everything else. We are not in the Midwest. Comes all the way up. Look at this, look at this, look at this. You probably just listened to the news. The price of oil is going through the roof. 27%. I guess, no wonder why no one's going on any road trips anymore. This might even stop people from coming to go to see their doctor. If you live in a rural area and now it's got to cost you that much more to go to the doctor. Now you're cold at your house and you don't turn on the heater. So now you get sick. All of this relates back to your health. All right. Electricity. Electricity has gone up 8, 8%. Okay, try to find competition for electricity. I don't know about you. I think I got Edison. That's about it. I'm out there like blowing a windmill or something, but you know, and even the solar panels they want to attack now. But the point is, is all of this is costing you more and you're, and we're all having to deal with this. And guess what causes stress causes you to make decisions. 
This causes you stress and it causes you to make decisions about your health you otherwise might not. It even may be doing it unconsciously. You're just subtly making different changes. You would go down this turn and maybe stop at the pharmacy to get that medication and maybe you take this turn and you'll get it next week. All right, here's another slide. It's costly, costly, costly. Inflation, the price of the things we want in total just last week hit 7%. 7%, okay. So what does that mean? A year ago, I bought something for a dollar. Now it's a dollar and seven cents. It was a hundred dollars. And then you add 7% more, a thousand dollars, 7% more. Yet you just got a pay cut to 7%. And now maybe I won't buy that gallon of milk. I'll wait for some people because now it's too expensive. But guess what? Or you won't buy certain medications because you don't have insurance and it's too costly. So this is what's happening behind the COVID that's also affecting you and the decisions you make to engage us in medicine. And it's important to at least realize it, to understand it, because then you have to make a plan to work around and through this. Here's a historic view on inflation. And if you notice here, back in the 80s, early 80s, it was super high, 14%. Remember all those people got mortgage loans and things here at 14%, they thought they had a good deal. I mean, they didn't, but people got it. You know, things went down after the recession in 2008, nine, right here, 2010. That's because everybody was broke. Everybody over leveraged, all the stuff that happened that you all know about happened here. Now we're bouncing around through here. And what is this? This is scary, okay? This is enough to bring you to the ER, all right? It's not here. That was bad. A lot of you were around during that time. But look at the sharp curve here. I bring this up because I think it's so important to understand what's happening behind COVID as people and the decisions we make and how do we make better decisions going forward. And as a physician, I want you to make the best decisions possible because I need you to be healthy. I need people all of us, including my family, to get out there and work and produce goods. I need everybody to be healthy by doing all the smart things that Dr. Lopez has mentioned. Okay, how about this? This is coming to an end. California just issued its final round of stimulus checks to residents earlier this week, 5.9 billion. Okay, currently no more payments planned. So we have an interesting thing going on and it's happening in medicine too. People are out. Okay, there's all kinds of things that it takes to make medicine work, everything in real life. Okay, we rely on the backbone of transportation, of removing hazardous waste, you know, of cleaning our buildings, keeping the lights working. All of those things that happen in any other business happen in medicine. But if people are out because they're ill and people are out because we're waiting for the stimulus checks, hey, I'm not putting blame here. This is a very important issue. You needed the help, you got it. But when this comes to an end, what's gonna happen? Maybe the medication you needed, you may not get. I don't know if they're gonna extend this. Maybe the, your copay on your insurance, you can't afford it, all right? So, that you're, so a lot of people who are gonna, these stimulus checks are gonna end, are gonna have to make some very difficult decisions coming up in the next few weeks. We gotta figure a way out of this. We've got to come up with individual plans and hope that the people in government also help. And here in medicine, we need to help too. We need to be aware of the financial situations of the community we serve. We need to be sensitive to your story and listen to you when you come to the office and you need to be brave enough to tell us that, hey doc, I don't have a job, my stimulus check ends, I still need to see you in the next couple of weeks, but my copay is this, can we work out a deal? Is there something that I can do to afford to come? You need to tell us that and we'll do everything we can to work it out. We need to hear it. If I don't hear it, I can't help you on that. There's no guarantees, every physician has a different situation, 
but we need to hear your story. We need to know where you are because we don't want it to affect your health. We have to break through these things. All right, let's talk about the next five years. Stop pipe dreaming. Give it up. COVID's here to stay in some form or fashion. I do hope in the next five years it becomes more endemic, fancy word for it comes hopefully just once a year. You know, right now we're seeing spikes generally in the winter and we see late spring, kind of summer. Right now, Australia's on fire. They're on summer. This is like their July. I'm thinking next July here, we're gonna have our other spike because of that. So how do we live with this? First of all is to accept that it's here to stay, regardless of where you fall. The point is, is that it's here to stay. So you need to make a plan. You need to learn how to live your life in the new world that's today, okay? And make good decisions. Learn to anticipate things. Be okay with change in your life because we keep, we keep thinking that, oh, the life has changed in the last few years. And I know everybody, the new year comes, New year came and everybody's like, man, maybe this is the last year. Sorry, I'm here to tell you it's not, okay? Things are gonna take a long time. I'm not saying it's not gonna get better. It's gonna take a long time for us to come in rhythm. I need you to anticipate. I need you to be okay with some chaos and be calm because as a human species, we're learning how to deal with this together. We're all in it together. We're all in the same dream or the same nightmare. Let's make it just a dream. Let's work through it. Learn to live as happy as you can. Make sure that happiness during this time is a focus in how you're living. There's a lot of other stresses. Learn that life is a risk, but minimizing risk is smart. You get out on the freeways. This is LA County. And for anybody who has to get on a freeway, it's very dangerous. You just turn on the news every morning, somebody bit the dust. Okay, there's somebody that didn't make it to work that day. All right, life is full of risks. We were born into a risky life. Every day that I live is one day, one day closer to death. That's the reality. I don't think about it every day. Maybe as a critical care doctor, I think about it more because I see life and death every day and have learned to accept the whole womb to tomb, whether I like things or not, or I like how it happens and that Bad things happen to good people. But the point is, is it's risky to live. You're still living, keep living, keep living strong, make it, make smart decisions, minimize the risk. All right, back to you. Priority one, stay healthy, be your own advocate. You have to keep calling the doctor's office, okay? This is not the time where Ring, ring. Hello, Mr. Sherman. Uh, your appointment's coming up tomorrow. I hope you're going to be there on time. Probably as much as I want that to happen. I'm sure some docs are still staying on top of it. Probably not going to happen. Today it's, hey, you better still have my appointment open tomorrow. All right, because I'm coming in. You know, you have to be your own advocate. You've got to call. You've got to engage. You, I don't care. You got to get their fax number. Fax them. Where's my appointment? I left an email. I left a call. You were marketing your own health. There's nothing more important than marketing yourself and your health and for your loved ones. You've got to do it. Make good decisions on your health and engage us. Engage medicine. Try living below your means. Avoid debt and depression. Go for that with inflation. That's tough but it will reduce your stress. Be aware of what I talked about, that goods are coming, gonna be more expensive. Be aware that you're planning a wedding next July, like my brother. Everything that he planned for this last year is now 7% more expensive. Who knows by the time of July, may have a divorce. <laughs> I'm just kidding, if he's listening. Our generation is in evolution. We are evolving as a species and learning. We are gonna go through an exponential learning in the next years, probably the next five to 10 years, there's more gonna happen due to technology and changes than has happened in the prior 30, 40 or 50 years. 
we are moving at lightning speed. That's why I feel like I'm holding on to the earth. You had COVID that we're trying to figure out. We are spinning very fast. You have to be calm. You have to understand we're in evolution. We're learning things about life now that we've never, our generation hadn't had to learn. Focus on joy in your lives and not material things. Material things don't last. And I know I'm a physician. I see people get into bad situations, life and death situations that may have happened over a materialistic thing. And I'm sure Dr. Lopez can attest to that too. Purpose. You know what? Everybody put their purpose on hold the last two years. What's your purpose? Why are you on this planet? What are you doing here? I want you to be healthy. I want you to see us. I want you to be your own advocate. I don't want you to stop calling me, okay? I want you to fight for your health and I will fight for you too. But I need to know your goals, your purpose. Occasionally when I speak, I will say, in two seconds, you gotta tell me how much you're worth. You better know how much you're worth, whether it's the time with your loved ones, whether you put $10 billion down, but you better be able to answer that question to the core of what you are worth, because that's how you make decisions. You need to know you are worth a lot and you've got to feel it and be it. So if I say, hey, in five seconds or less, you better tell me what you're worth. You got to know, because that's what you're basing decisions. You're basing decisions of risk and seeing the doctor and what's my life worth? Oh, forget it. I'll, I had that, that chest pain. I'll put it off next week. Well, if you're worth $10 billion to yourself, well, you're going to go see the doctor now. You're not gonna put it off. Make sure you're providing joy in your life. Learn how to give joy to others. Right now, we need a lot of joy. Focus on what's important. But guess what? You can't do any of this out there. You can't see me as a physician, all the other physicians. You can't engage healthcare if you don't love yourself first. Loving yourself is getting to us, seeing to us, giving us an opportunity to tell you what we think, having a discussion. We don't always have to agree on it, but we at least need to get the discussion out. We need to talk about good treatments, therapies, all of the things that we've always done and all of the history of medicine that continu continuously changes. So I wanna thank you very much for listening to this different talk and try to make a plan. This is 2022, not 21, not 20. It's not even COVID-19 anymore. It's COVID-22. It's gonna be COVID-23, 24. Make a plan, work the plan, beat COVID, make smart decisions. Don't stop coming to see us. Thank you. All right, if you guys out there aren't really jazzed up and ready to take on the new year, you never will be. Uh, I, I, I want to thank Dr. Lopez uh, again for bringing us the new things that we know about uh, Omicron. As uh, both of the speakers spoke about, this is an evolution of new information. Uh, we're always used to knowing everything. And we are now having to learn what it's like not to know everything right now. And there is a comfort level that we can get to by just accepting that, yes, we will learn it and someday we'll look back on these days and we'll tell all the stories. Um, and, and we can have the reassurance that this isn't the end of mankind that we are gonna beat this and we'll figure it out. And we just have to kind of accept that. But in that acceptance, we have to realize we still have to take care of everything else. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of our families. You can't let go regular day-to-day -day life until, this, until you figure out what this is. And I think that was the whole purpose of why we wanted to bring this talk to you early in the year is to just kind of we may be hanging on by our bootstraps, but, but make yourself feel comfortable that that's okay. So that's my little um, addition to the speakers. I now am going to entertain questions that are coming to us from our audience. So I'm gonna start with the first question this evening. My son had COVID 
one month ago. He was vaccinated, but not boosted. He was age 24. He had fever, sore throat, cough, complete exhaustion, night sweats, and he had a positive PCR. He still seems to be pretty tired. And he just told me he's having some sore throats frequently, especially after waking. He refuses to follow up with his doctor how can, he, what can he do to avoid long COVID? He's on baby aspirin. And I think this is a really good question because we all think about COVID in the short term, but the longer we live with COVID, we know that there are some long-term problems. So I'm going to address this um, uh, question to our speakers and they can kind of tell us a little bit more about long COVID and what this young man can do. We have been seeing with uh, some of our long-term patients, and it's defined as having symptoms that are new or recurring weeks or months after the initial infection in itself. It is diagnosed generally about four weeks afterwards, and um, unfortunately, we now have many long-term COVID um, clinics that are starting to treat patients like this. Now, Long COVID is something that, of course, we're still learning a lot about. And again, it all depends on many factors. It depends on the patient themselves. It depends on what their immunity status was when they were infected. It depends on what treatments they potentially received. And um, of course, and the unknown is the inflammatory response, which is actually driving the long COVID uh, symptoms that we're seeing in patients. So uh, the inflammation that we see and causes the post-acute syndrome after COVID infection um, is treated essentially in a multidisciplinary uh, way in the same way that it affects many organs. So it can affect the brain. Many patients have uh, been experiencing fatigue, brain fog. I see a lot of patients that I see that they say, I just don't feel the same. I can't think as fast. So many patients have uh, recurring respiratory symptoms like the sore throat, post-nasal drip, congestion. Uh, of course, we know of uh, probably uh, all of us know at least uh, some patients or stories of people that have had long-term lung damage and need continued oxygen treatment. Uh, COVID is also well known to affect the heart. So there is cardiac post care that is needed sometimes. And of course it can affect other organs like the kidneys um, as well. And it can essentially affect any part of your body. You can have different, uh, the way that you're, you digest food can be different for a long time. Um, and of course there is the sense of taste and smell that we were seeing. So it's difficult to say, between, you know, every patient is different, um, but you have to think of long COVID as inflammation and the inflammatory response that the body's having. And so the way that you treat it is different for everybody. Um, so most of the times we see patients go and uh, address these based on symptom status. And so we usually parse it out and try to see if we can manage symptoms. Um, there's always also uh, patients that will need more specific care like cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, there's sense of taste and smell rehabilitation that is available for some now. Um, so it all depends on the patient and the symptoms. Um, but COVID is unfortunately uh, like we all talked about before, is something that affects so many uh, different people in different ways. And the array of symptoms and the severity can be different in the length of time, something that we're still learning a lot about. Um, so it's important to know that if you're having symptoms, bring it up. We don't know about a lot of these patients because we don't know that they're having symptoms still. Um, so unless you bring it up, we can't know how to potentially help you. So that's at least what I would recommend. All right, now our next question. I'm very afraid of contracting the virus by going out of the house or keeping my appointments. As long as I feel good, is it okay to postpone regular appointments, wellness checks uh, that have been recommended by my daughter, uh, doctor because of COVID-19 or Omicron? I'll take that one. So a couple of things is, first of all, you know, the one thing about COVID that I've learned, this virus, is that 
the individual symptoms that it makes are as, almost as individual as all of us. It's like there's so many organs that are affected by this ACE2 receptor we have. It's all over in our body and everybody is so different and that's what makes it hard. But, you know, I wonder if you're thinking what I'm gonna say about this question and what I'm gonna answer. So first of all, I am very upbeat. We're gonna do fantastic with this. It's gonna take some time. I'm just a realist. I want everybody to be strong and buckle up and work hard and just do what our ancestors did and survive and have fun while we're doing it. That's what's important. There's no guarantees, but you might as well have fun while you're living, no matter what it is. So first of all, no, you should not avoid your maintenance appointments. So sometimes as humans, we take better care of our cars than we do ourselves. It's like the red light goes on in the car. Uh-oh, better get an oil change. Uh-oh, it's time for the service. Better take it in, drop it off the dealership or the auto shop and you do it. But when it comes to us, it's like, uh-oh, just turn that light off and we keep going. Well, eventually things break down. So it's so important. That's what's gonna keep you safe. It's gonna keep you safe. First of all, the fear. First thing is to recognize that you are having fear because of the COVID situation and it's real and it's okay. Embrace the fear, face it and say, okay, how can I minimize my fear? I can wear a mask. I can keep my hands clean. I can keep my hands away from my face. I can stay out of crowded areas. I can be vaccinated. There's all these, these different ways to reduce the fear so you can continue on in your life. You know, I can avoid concerts and all different kinds of places that have crowds. I'm not saying not have a good time. I can avoid sick people, right? If you're sick and you know your friends are sick and they're like, oh, it's nothing. No, put it off till they're better. Tell them to get tested. You know, that lunch date can wait. Better to have fun. Wait till they're better. So if you do all of these good decision making, as far as us in the medical community, we've made our offices and our locations to be with you as safe as we can. Okay? There's not going to be any other safer place than a doctor who is obsessed about making sure their office is clean as possible and as safe as possible and spread out and putting out appointments where they used to see, you know, multiple people a day and it's dropped into half. Maybe their days are longer. Maybe they're open on a Saturday now trying to make sure they're seeing you. So don't be afraid. Those are going to be the safest places to be. Okay. So when you make the right decisions, you write, you wear the right personal protection. You've now upsized your, you upped your mask to the big boy N95 or KN95. You're going to your doctor's office. You've called you know where it is, you know where you're gonna park, you know how you like to go in, you know, and you just do what you've always done, okay? And you just be aware of your surroundings and everything's gonna be okay. But please, please go to your appointments because guess what? If you don't, you're gonna be seeing her. And if you're that sick after seeing her, you're gonna be with me in the critical care unit, life and death, okay? You don't wanna follow this pattern. Trust me. You don't want to see us. Yeah. So I think that's the answer. But first of all, recognize the fear and then push through it safely. And as a primary care doctor, I can echo what Dr. Sherman said, that the cleanest places in the world right now is all of the providers for healthcare, whether it's mammogram, physical therapy, your doctor's office, anywhere you go. In the hospital, they are absolutely just dead set on separating COVID patients from anybody else. So you never have to worry about your exposure in the medical setting. That's where you are the safest. And if you're worried about COVID, it's probably worse to deal with COVID if you have cancer or if you have a heart attack. So do what you can to always minimize, minimize those other risks. So I'm gonna go on to other questions here. To the speakers, will it be recommended that the general population get a second booster? And would that fourth booster be in April or May of 2022? 
Where's the crystal balls, guys? Well, I think that's an, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think um, obviously we have proven that the vaccines are effective. Howsoever, Omicron has also proven that the uh, mutation has changed significantly from uh, the ancestral strain. Uh, people are working on this. I don't, I think it's too early to tell, but it is, I think, pretty widely known now that the vaccine will very likely be modified because a fourth booster may not be as effective as a vaccine that is actually able to target um, not just the spike protein, but a different aspect of the virus in itself. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. It's difficult to predict because this these viruses, not just, just SARS viruses, um, but all viruses are generally smart. They mutate. We try to predict what's happening you know, even with the flu every year, we say, hey, what's going on in the southern hemispheres during their winter and, you know, and what happens when it comes around here. So, you know, it's a, this is a difficult science, even pre-pandemic. And we do pretty good, generally, but we'll have to see what happens. And there's a lot of good people at the bench, like really studying this you know, behind the scenes where they're in the labs, trying to find out the mutations, where these proteins mutate at, where vaccines work at, and testing, testing, testing against this formidable opponent. So I think we'll learn more and I can expect to see more information coming out. A lot of you have heard on the news at least recently that people have been working on a vaccine that may help against Omicron. Well, heck, I mean, this Omicron's burning through faster than probably the vaccine will come out, right? So it's really looking ahead. And I think you'll find more information. Be tuned. I wish I had a great answer for you, but we'll see what's coming and with and who and what type of patients, right? I mean, there's immunosuppressed patients. Mm -hmm. There's higher, there's people that have more risk. You know, do they need a fourth vaccine before somebody healthy who's already had vaccines? Or, you know, so, you know, we'll, we're continuing to study that. And I think you'll see certain populations will be focused on and we'll find out as when we know you're going to know, this is the first time in history. All right. How should I handle false positives? It seems counterintuitive to go get another test when I'm already exhibiting symptoms. So I guess I'd like to make this kind of a two prong, uh, uh, question because we've already talked about false negatives. One, do we get false positives or is it more common to get false negatives? I would say false positives are extremely rare. Uh, if you have symptoms and you test positive, please act as if you have the if you have the disease. Um, it is. I mean, you could potentially PCR um, if you have access to it, but if you have symptoms and you test positive. You could have reinfection. I have I saw this from the very beginning. I work in LA County, and from the very first three months of COVID nineteen, we were seeing reinfections. And so we still don't know this disease is not something that we've experienced. And so you could potentially have a reinfection. Uh, so act as if you have it. Yeah, my my take is, you know, first of all, it's complicated. And did you have one of those antigen? tests that were not as sensitive or specific and they're positive, but you do have symptoms or don't have symptoms. So first of all, if you have a positive test, you have to take it positively and you have to say, okay, I'm worried because there's more, there are less false positives than false negatives, right? That's how the tests work. That's the good part about these tests, whether they're antigens and PCRs being more sensitive and specific, well, basically sensitive, we can catch everything. Specific means, hey, if you got it, you got it, okay? So you need to check yourself, look at your symptoms. Is it truly false and how do you know it's false? You know, you can retest, you can get a PCR, find a way to do, engage your physician about your particular situation because for us here, we're saying the test always involves a story and the story is very important to why did you test and how did you test and what are you feeling about this test? And that's the engagement you need with your physician if you're concerned and you can do a televisit, you know, 
email. There's a lot of different ways. So when you have this situation, take it seriously. That's when I would engage your healthcare provider about your particular story so we can help guide you through the process. And I have one more question that I am going to take. I know we're getting uh, low on time, but uh, Dr. Lopez kind of mentioned this. And, and one of the worst parts of this pandemic is trying to know when you're getting good information. What is the latest recommendation for an individual who tests positive but is asymptomatic? Does the person isolate or quarantine for five days or 10 days? That is a great question. Um, if you test positive and you are asymptomatic, I would recommend at the very least isolating for five days. Um, it's very difficult to predict what symptoms versus the viral load is for each patient specifically. So although you may be asymptomatic, you are still potentially contagious. So please isolate for at least five days. And if you isolate after that, please take a rapid antigen test. That will kind of give you a good idea of how contagious you potentially are. If you test positive, please continue to mask at the very least around other people. Um, and I would recommend that you really limit your activity uh, for at least five more days. So I would definitely recommend at least an isolation of five days. I still generally recommend an isolation of 10 days for anybody that uh, tests positive um, with very minimal contact, only, only essential things that you would need to do after day five. Yeah, I think about it as even though there's a lot of talk about the CDC's guidelines, you know, so if you have a positive test, you're positive and now you want to isolate for the next five days. You saw Dr. Lopez's line of when you become symptomatic, when the test becomes positive. So it could take days for you to feel ill. And the thing about it is being safe because you may do very well with this, but your neighbor who you went to help cross the street down the road may not, okay? or your child who gets sick, or somebody else you have contact with that you were unaware. So the five days at home isolation, multiple, you know, retesting, if you have any symptoms at all, you know, you continue on that for another five days. If you're asymptomatic and you're going by the CD with five days of a mask and you now wear a mask and go about your business. But even in the CDC website, you know, you're still supposed to, and it makes sense. It's about common sense, not having a lot of contact with people and wearing a mask, a good mask. I think about it this way, is if I'm sick with anything and I have symptoms of that illness, coughing, sneezing, I mean, everybody's been on an airplane or a bus and somebody's sneezing and coughing behind you, there's nothing more uncomfortable than that. And you can almost feel the spray coming on your neck, whether it is or not, your mind is feeling in that. And you know what? You just can't do that today because this is a whole different world with, with coronavirus. So stay home, don't let that happen. And you don't wanna infect the people you love. So do the course do the five days, retest, follow the CDC guidelines. If there's a question, guess what? That's why we're here, okay? For your individual story. That's why everybody has individual physicians. If you don't have a physician and you're feeling really ill and you don't have insurance, you know, then there's a lot of clinics that are open. Yeah, you're gonna have to wait in line, but you're an advocate for yourself. If you feel different symptoms, you're not sure, shortness of breath, but you don't know what to do, is that symptoms or not, then you can go to an urgent care. All thank right, you. so I wanna thank our speakers. They've just been wonderful tonight, giving us lots of good information. And yes, we'd all love to feel like we're at that place where we know what's going on. The nice thing to know is we'll get there. One of these days, we'll just look back on the early days of COVID and we'll wonder, you know, why did we get so shook up? Because we will figure it out. So hang in there. We look forward to seeing you the rest of this year for other uh, Miracle of Living um, uh, uh, talks. And 
we're just all going to hang in there together and be as healthy as we possibly can. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>